Good afternoon and welcome to Design Master Training. My name is David Robison. Today we are be going to be looking at creating custom blocks for Design Master Electrical in AutoCAD. We're also going to be looking at uh, a kind of a set of questions that we've had emailed to us over the last month, just uh, looking at some support questions that I think would be interesting for other people to take a look at. If you're attending the training live, you can ask questions in the chat box. If you are watching the recording of the training, you can call or email your questions. Our phone number is 866-516-9497, and our email address is support at designmaster.biz. So to start, we are going to be looking at creating custom blocks with Design Master Electrical. So I've got here uh, a pair of blocks that we're going to be creating. You do all of this with the block creation commands. Uh, if we go into Design Master Electrical here, uh, they're in this block creation section in the pull down menu. Uh, the commands are available there. There's a couple different commands. There's the create plan view block from entities. That's generally what you want to be using. So that's creating a new 2D block for a light fixture or something. You can also create a 3D block uh, if you want to have some 3D representations. You can also use a block, uh, this, the block from this drawing if you have a block and you've opened it up and you just want to add our attributes to it. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of commands, uh, similar commands for creating one line diagram blocks. But we're going to be looking at just the 2D blocks today. I'm going to run the create plan view block from entities command. And when I run this command, it displays the create plan view block dialog box, which is kind of big and it's got a lot of different options. So we'll go over those a little bit here. Before we look at those, I want to look at the kind of a view of how Design Master views the blocks that it has. So I'm going to open up this file here. Uh, so when you're when Design Master is thinking about blocks, there's kind of three spots that they are stored. First, there is the actual file in your file system. So there will be a DWG file sitting in your customization folder. So that's the block that the, the drawing file that we pull in and it's created as a block in your drawing. That's standard how AutoCAD works with, with external blocks. Then we also have an entry in the Design Master block list. Uh, so this is the list of blocks that you can use for certain types of devices. So we've got the uh, the light fixture blocks and we've got the receptacle blocks. Uh, and that set of blocks is actually custom between the project and the master. So the master is what's going to be pulled into new projects. And then the project is what you happen to be using in that project. So you can have something that's specific to just one project uh, without putting it in your master for all future projects. Uh, but that's just a block that can be used. It's not actually a light fixture because there's more to a light fixture than what it looks like. Uh, so for that, we have the project schedule, all of the schedules. So for light fixtures, we have the light fixture project schedule or the master schedule where we actually define the light fixture and use a block as the graphical representation, but also set the other things such as load and voltage. Uh, so when you're thinking about blocks and working with your blocks, there's kind of these three levels that uh, the blocks are going to exist. You have the drawing file itself. You have the entry as a block for that type of device that can be used, and then you have the actual uh, device defined in the schedule. So if we go back to uh, Design Master here, the block name corresponds to number one. This is the name of the file in the file system that's going to be created. So I'm going to create a two by four light because we're going to create uh, this block here. It happens to be a two by four light fixture with a little inset there. The uh, other options, uh, skipping over all of this, we're going to jump down to the database set settings. If we click the create records in database, the block type is going to control whether we're creating, uh, you know, obviously a light fixture or a receptacle or whatever. And then we have the option to create it in the block list and the schedule. So going back to our, our three entries here, that corresponds to number two and number three. So we create the block on the file system. That's just a file but then we need to load it into Design Master so it knows to be used. So we can create it as a block for uh, being used uh, in the block list. And then we can actually create a schedule entry. It kind of creates the default stuff that you can then fill in. So we're gonna not put it in the master because I don't want to fill up my master with all this stuff. And we'll create a record in the project uh, block list and in the schedule. 
If we leave these values blank, it's just going to pull in the block name. I'll put in a custom name here, 2x4 light fixture. Uh, and then in this project, this is going to be light fixture type. We'll call it uh, training. And that will create all of our records. If you don't actually want it in your schedule, if you're just setting up blocks for future use, you might uncheck this and just create it in your block list. You might actually be putting it just in your master block list and not in your project at all. Going back to the other settings, these are going to control how that block is created. We have the option to move the entities to zero, layer zero. Generally speaking, leave that checked unless you understand how blocks use layer zero, how AutoCAD handles that, and, and you want to not have it on layer zero. Uh, you can use kind of embed colors, but uh, you lose some functionality if you uncheck that. So we, you know, make sure you understand how blocks work or just leave that checked and everything will work out. Uh, we can do a highlight. This is where Design Master uses a second color. Our receptacles come in as a white and green thing. So if you check that, you get a second uh, color. Whether it can rotate, you check that. Uh, like the slight fixture can rotate. If it's just a, a circle or something, and maybe it can't rotate and it's just always going to look the same because it's just a little graphical representation. Final checkbox is whether it is to scale. Uh, this is if you're inserting it as the actual size or if it's something that is more symbolic. So this light fixture is a two by four light fixture. It should be two feet by four feet when inserted on the drawing. So it is to scale. Uh, the receptacle that we're going to create is not to scale. So we will uncheck this. Then we have the option for where we want to connect our loops and leaders. We can connect to specific points on it, to the edge of a circle or to the edge of a rectangle. I'll set rectangle so that it kind of tracks nicely with this uh, rectangle on this light fixture. Finally, we have the option to create a slide. Uh, I should have included that here. So uh, under here, there's also custom block.sld. That is going to be the little picture that is displayed when you're choosing it uh, in for number two or number three. Uh, so it, it has no bearing on what happens in the drawing. It just makes it easier to choose. If you don't set a slide, you just get that blue X that you see sometimes. Uh, just to demonstrate that, I'm going to uncheck create slide so there's no slide created and then we'll create it later as a second step. All that is correct. I will click OK. Now it wants me to select the entities to use in the block. I'm going to do this light fixture here, get everything. We'll do the base point at this corner. Uh, now it wants to know where to connect the leaders. And I said it's going to be a rectangle, so it wants the two corners of the rectangle. So I do the top left and the bottom right. It does its thing and it's created it. Now I can actually go over to my drawing here, uh, where I've got this project that I've been that I created the block in. Uh, well, first let's take a look at the uh, customization uh, folder. So if I go to my installation settings, uh, it'll tell me where my customization folder is. I can press the open button to go to where that is, and we'll see that we've got that two by four light DWG file. So there's the light drawing file. Then if we go to the uh, block list, light fixture blocks, scroll down to the bottom. So we've got our new entry here. So this is where it shows up as an option to choose. So this is all our different graphics we can use. We have the new choice here. It's got the two by four lights with that description I included. And finally, it created an entry in the schedule for me, called it our training light fixture. And it filled it in with default uh, information, just lighting 64 VA, 120 volt. Obviously, you know, it, it just put information in there and then you'd have to come in and fill this in properly uh, so that it's actually right. And you'll see that we've got that blue X that I was mentioning. So we don't have a slide file, so there's nothing to display here. So we, the, just the way uh, AutoCAD works, it needs a little picture file. It can't display the drawing itself. So we need that little slide file. So we'll leave that as it is and we'll insert one on the drawing. So now we have our light fixtures being inserted and we can circuit them. And then I'm going to draw the home run of the loops. And you'll see that uh, we defined the edge as that rectangle. And so it knows to connect that loop to the edge of the rectangle there. Now we have that uh, missing slide. So we can create that manually using the create slide command. I'll run that. It wants the name of the slide file to, to create. It needs to be the same name as the block file. 
So I'm going to change it. I'm going to look at all my uh, drawing files. Uh, so this is the name of the block file. I'll get rid of that extension. Save it as 2 by 4 light. Basically, you're going to take a little snapshot of the drawing. So whatever is in this space is going to be in the slide. So I could take a picture of this and be just the block just to show you that it's actually taking a, a snapshot. I'll do one that includes the home run call out. You typically wouldn't include that, but we will just uh, to demonstrate. So I'll draw this box and it takes a little snapshot of that for us. And now when we insert the light fixture, it includes that picture. So that's just a picture. Uh, it doesn't have any bearing on what actual block is going to be inserted. It's not going to include this home run because that's not part of the block. Uh, you could take a picture of something else. That would be confusing, but you can. Uh, so that's just a purely just a, a graph, of just a little picture to show you what you're selecting. Now we're going to go back and we're going to create this receptacle block. Uh, I'm going to adjust my dim scale because I have that drawn properly for an eighth scale drawing. So you need to have your dim scale set right when you create your block. So typically you insert, you go to your drawing, you insert your receptacle or whatever block and just make sure it looks right uh, for the scale factor that you have. And then when you create the block, it will come in properly. We will come and run the create plan view block from entities command. We are going to uncheck the two scale, meaning that this is going to change scale uh, as we change the dim scale. We could do uh, connected to the edge of the loops to the edge of a circle. I'm actually going to do points just to demonstrate something a little bit different. And we'll have it create the slide automatically. We'll specify this as a receptacle. And we'll call it the training receptacle. We will choose these entities for the block, specify the base point, and now it wants to know the points where leaders can connect. Uh, so if you have something that's not just a circle or a rectangle, you can just kind of select points and kind of define where you want loops to attach. Uh, in this case, I'll just choose a couple random spots around the edge of the circle. And you'll see it puts in these little attributes here. This is how we're going to track in the block where these points are. And now we can insert that receptacle. It created the slide for us automatically, which was nice. And we can put it on the drawing here. And if we uh, insert a note or add some uh, loops to it, you'll see that it snaps the uh, uh, leader of that note to the specific point. So it's not tracing the edge of the circle, it's just snapping to specific points. Now, the difference between a two-scale and not two-scale drawing, uh, a block, is how it reacts to the dim scale uh, system variable. So if I change the dim scale from 96, which is an eighth scale drawing, to 48, which is a quarter scale drawing, if I insert a new light fixture and I insert another training light fixture, it's going to come in as a 2 by 4 light fixture. So it's still the exact same size because it's two scale. And so the scale factor doesn't actually influence the size. It's still two feet by four feet. So there's our new light fixture. It matches the one that we inserted previously. If I go and insert another receptacle, it's actually going to be smaller because the receptacle is just purely diagrammatic. It's like text. And so uh, this is counterintuitive, but we want it to be the same size on the printed page, no matter the scale factor. So we actually change the size in the AutoCAD drawing. So if we make it, if the scale factor is, is twice what it was, we actually have to make the receptacle half as big. So now we've got an, a quarter scale receptacle and an eighth scale receptacle. So if you print this at quarter scale, this will be the right size, and this one will be too big. Uh, if you ever change the dim scale in a project uh, or on a drawing, if you run the coordinate drawings in database command, it will clean up any ones that uh, need to be changed. So if we run that command, it will fix these uh, receptacles as well. So there it made those smaller. And it also made our text a little bit smaller uh, as well for the new scale factor. Are there any questions related to block creation? I'm going to move on to uh, some questions that came in through support uh, that I wanted to talk about. The first was a question related to feeder taps. This is the image the customer sent in. I think this is uh, probably pulled from the NEC handbook. Uh, he had this situation. He wanted to know, OK, for Design Master, how would you model this section here where you've got uh, things connected to these feeder taps? 
what does the best way to model that with our software? Uh, and the answer is that you probably want to use a wire way for that. So if you go back to our software, we have uh, a couple different options, uh, 12 or so pieces of distribution equipment. And so those are things that you can connect other things to. Uh, it's kind of generically what they are. Uh, and they all react a little bit differently. So if we go to, uh, to this list here, you can see them listed out uh, with their names. So a panel uh, is pretty straightforward. A switchboard is just like a panel, but the um, numbering is a little bit differently. Uh, in this case, we have wireways and bus gutters, which are probably the two closest uh, options for, for what was shown there. The bus gutter is going to have a bus size. So if I run the bus gutter command, uh, you'll see it actually has a bus amps. So it actually has a size for the bus. Uh, so that's where it has a main bus and, and it's sized. Uh, the difference between that and a wireway is that the wireway is not going to have that as an option. So if we go to the wireway, there's no bus size. Uh, so that's the main difference between those two. Uh, and so based upon this picture, there's no bus. Uh, it's just some wires. Uh, so that would be what Design Master would consider a wireway. Uh, so that would be the best choice. And then you can just, you know, you can connect these to the specific uh, slots on the wireway and then carry on your design from there. Uh, all the other pieces of uh, distribution equipment all have their own special uh, uniqueness to them because they're all just slightly different. Uh, panels, switchboards, wireways, bus gutters are all pretty similar uh, from how the software is viewing them. Uh, just slightly different uh, values being set. Transformers, uh, their main thing obviously is that they have a primary and a secondary voltage. Enclosed breaker uh, is our, our go-to if you have just some sort of one-off item. Uh, obviously, you said if you have a breaker or a disconnect, you can model it with this or just any sort of thing that doesn't really fit anything else. We typically recommend using enclosed breaker for just a connection point. Uh, we have UPSs or phase inverters. Uh, they're kind of lumped together. Uh, these um, can have two inputs, uh, normal and a bypass. They also have uh, can have a different primary and a secondary voltage if there's actually a voltage change in the UPS or phase inverter. Uh, motor control centers uh, have a couple additional pieces of information uh, compared to like a switchboard. Um, they're not a full-fledged motor control center uh, that you could use for industrial design. Uh, it, it's a uh, kind of a, a limited implementation of that. Um, and then meter centers are similar to panels uh, where it's uh, automatically rotating your phases for you and, and giving you typically two pole connection points. Uh, generators, you can't connect them to anything. They're, they're just a source. Uh, and then a transfer switch is gonna have two connection points uh, for modeling transfer switches. And low voltage panels are if you need to connect your low voltage devices, which in Design Master is basically anything between below 120 volts. Um, so your fire alarm or your nurse call, if you have a panel, you can connect stuff up to it. Um, we don't do a whole lot with that, but uh, it is there as an option uh, if you're doing that. And then we have recurring panel templates and instances. Those are like panels that uh, are, are used multiple times. Uh, the next question uh, that I have from the mailbag is uh, how to show uh, breakers on the one-line diagram on feeders. So I'm going to insert my one-line diagram here. So in this example, we've created our one-line diagram, and there is no breaker being shown on the feeder. And there's a couple different ways you can set that. Uh, there's kind of different uh, levels depending on how uh, many places you want it to show up. So the first way is uh, if you just have a specific feeder and you want to show a breaker on it, you can run the change graphics command from the one line diagram. So we call run change graphics. I'm actually going to choose this breaker, uh, this feeder here. And we can set a breaker on that feeder. And now for just that one feeder, it'll add that graphic and show it for you. You can also, uh, in the device itself, specify that the feeder should have a breaker. So if we uh, take a look at this panel here and go to the one line diagram block settings, we have the upstream overcurrent protection block. Right now it's just using the setting in the upstream panel. 
I could force it to use, uh, we'll do this different looking block, we'll do the circuit breaker with blocks. And now when we update our one line diagram, this feeder will get that block added automatically. So you can modify the feeder, you can modify the piece of equipment, it's upstream breaker. You can also modify the piece of equipment to say everything connected to this should have a, a breaker by default. So I'm gonna go to L1 and say all the connections connected to L1 should have a breaker. That's again in the one line diagram block settings, the circuit breaker block. This one I'm gonna say, uh, it's actually a fused switch. This uh, panel instead of having circuit breakers happens to have fused switches on all of its uh, connections. So we make that change and we do our update and since these are using the default, it'll put those uh, blocks in there for us automatically. Finally, we can go to options and say for this project, we should have a default block being used. So right now, by the default is none, so it's not going to include a breaker block, uh, but we can override that and say by default, let's use uh, just the breaker block. And now when we run our update, anywhere that doesn't have a block, it's gonna include one. And so then once they're being included automatically, you would then could do, go through the same set of options and just change them to none if you don't wanna show it in a specific spot. So if I wanted to not show it on this feeder, I could modify that one feeder, set the overcurrent block, protection block to none. Any questions on one line diagrams and those overcurrent protection blocks? If not, the uh, next thing I will look at is a question related to voltage drop that a customer sent in. Basically, they had a, a situation where they had multiple devices connected together and the voltage drop was not what they expected. And so they were trying to just understand what was going on with the voltage drop. And in particular, they were focused down here on like panel one, two, three, four, where it's up at 12%. And they're saying, why is this voltage drop so high? Um, what can we do to address that? And if you come in here and say, okay, let's change panel one. So I'll go find panel one and it's currently a 225 amp panel. So it's got a 225 amp feeder. If I upsize that, uh, let's go to a 400 amp feeder, for example. It's currently at 12.83% voltage drop we insert the voltage drop schedule again to redo the calculation. So it goes from 12.83 to 12.44. So we seriously upsized that wire and it didn't really change the voltage drop. So they were basically asking what's going on? How can I get that voltage drop to go down? Uh, and the answer is that this voltage drop here is the total voltage drop for the whole system from the utility. So even though it's really high here, it's not actually from the feeder between the switchboard and the panel. The voltage drop is coming from other spots in this project. Uh, so what you can do when you run your voltage drop schedule uh, in the columns, we have the specific feeder voltage drop. If we turn that on, it can shed some light into what's going on here. And you can see over here, this is the voltage drop on each of the feeders. And so panel LP1, has 0.5% voltage drop. So it's not really that significant. Uh, all the voltage drop is coming from this, the two transformers and this feeder, really. Uh, in this case, we actually have the voltage drop uh, through the transformers being included. So we're not uh, adjusting the, the voltage on the taps of the transformers. We can adjust uh, how Design Master sets it and say, okay, Let's just uh, ignore the voltage drop through the transformer and that'll reduce those values there with the assumption that you're gonna adjust the, the, vol the voltage on your taps um, so that uh, it accounts for the voltage drop. So for voltage drops and transformers, we're gonna change that to ignore. Run our voltage drop schedule again. I'm gonna get rid of a couple of these branch circuit columns just so that we can see uh, the numbers closer to the labels. So now the voltage drop through these transformers, uh, it's just the voltage drop through the feeder, so it's much smaller. Uh, but we still have these uh, 
values that are above 3%. And we could upsize these all day long, but there's only half a percent of voltage drop coming on those feeders. And it's already 2.9 when we get to the switchboard. So no change we make there is really going to impact it. It's really the feeder here to this H panel that we need to adjust, uh, which is one of the reasons why we uh, don't upsize wires automatically for voltage drop, because there's some engineering judgment that has to happen. So we see that, okay, this 3.39 is too high, this 2.9 is okay, uh, but it's not really this feeder that's the issue, it's actually this feeder back here. And so you as the engineer need to analyze the design, figure out where in the system you should make a change to address the voltage drop. Uh, the software could make some judgments, but the, at the moment we're leaving it to you to, to analyze your design and figure out what you'd want to adjust. So we can go to that H panel and change that wire size. It's currently a 400 amp uh, feeder. I set it to 500 feet just so we have a really uh, high voltage drop. So that's why it's so big here. So we'll upsize it, um, something much larger. So it's got 2.34% voltage drop. Run the voltage drop command again to redo the calculation. It went from 2.34 to 1.15, so a much more manageable voltage drop. Everything is now uh, within uh, appropriate tolerances. So if you, uh, as you're looking at your voltage drop, that those are the, some of the things you want to look for uh, to figure out why the values are so high and where to make adjustments. We also had a question uh, actually come in today asking about RV parks that I thought would be uh, interesting to look at. So I'm going to pull up my RV park project. Now RV parks uh, are interesting uh, in Design Master. We do have them modeled properly with the load calcs, uh, but the way the RV parks are set up is typically you have pedestals at each uh, spot in the RV park um, where you can drive your RV up and connect it. Uh, and the calculation um, that the NEC does, it treats each of those pedestals um, more like a feeder in service uh, load calculation rather than a branch circuit. So our software actually views it as a, a feeder in service load calculation rather than a branch circuit calculation. So Whenever people do a, a RV park, you want to insert those pedestals as a receptacle. That's the kind of obvious way to do it. Uh, and everyone goes through and does that. Uh, but then the calculations are done as branch circuit calculations and they don't actually work out. So to model it properly, you need to model each of the pedestals as an individual panel. Um, it's closer to like an apartment complex where you've got multiple uh, apartments, one for each uh, RV, um, which is, they're close to what an RV is, a small traveling apartment. So each of those pedestals actually needs to be modeled as a separate uh, piece of distribution equipment. Since they're very similar, typically uh, a recurring panel template would be the right way to do it. So you'd create a template and then create an instance for each RV uh, site. So you can see here we've got uh, the RV sites defined, RV 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, and then 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And typically then they're also daisy chained together so that all of these are really on one circuit on the panel. So one through five are on a circuit and six through 10 are on a circuit. So we've uh, connected those up that way in the model. So if we look at how our connections are set up, we've got this X panel, which is the top panel. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five connected and then six connected to X and then seven, eight, nine, ten 10 downstream of that. And then we look at panel X and we can see that we have the connections happening there for uh, the first circuit and the second circuit with those uh, two pedestals and everything downstream connected to them. Uh, and it's counting up the number of sites. So there's 10 total sites. So that'll give us the load uh, at this panel based upon uh, those connections. The actual feeder uh, for those is defined based upon five uh, RV sites so you want to insert a panel schedule for the uh, first site, so RV1 or RV6. If they're the same, you only would really need one of these, uh, some sort of typical panel. But this will give you the load just on that one branch circuit based upon the diversity, based upon the number of sites. So for RV1 here, you can see that we've got five sites connected 
and we've got uh, 130 amps required for that. But up at the uh, main panel, we've got two of those. They're both sim the same. They both require 130 amp uh, feeders uh, to the RV1 and RV6. But the total load on this is only 200 because of the diversity. So it's not 260, it's actually 200 uh, because we've got the diversity based on 10 sites. So that's how you would model RV parks in our software. And the final thing that I want to take a look at is creating custom breaker curves for selective coordination. Uh, so our new software that's currently in beta adds uh, breaker curves. And a request made uh, last month when we were showing it off was the ability to add a, a generic curve uh, to the graph. Um, the specific example was a generator decrement curve, but it could be any kind of curve that we don't have in the software already. Uh, so I want to show you how you can do that now with the software. Go back to this project here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a, uh, a graph. So we're going to insert a selective coordination graph. We'll just use panel H1. Uh, we'll use the main disconnect on that panel, and I'll set the curve settings for it. All right, so there uh, is the coordination graph with our uh, curve for that breaker based upon the settings we've specified. And now we want to add an additional curve uh, representing, in this case, our, our generator. So what we have from the manufacturer I go to my folder here, is we have this PDF, which is uh, the technical, technical information about our generator. And if we scroll down to the fourth page, we've got the breaker curve, uh, the generator curves. Uh, there's a, the damage curve that the manufacturer gives us. And so these are the curves we want, we want to include uh, on that graph. So we are going to uh, digitize this curve and include it. First thing we need to do is actually get the PDF into the soft, uh, into AutoCAD. So you can actually, uh, in recent versions of AutoCAD, just insert a PDF directly. Uh, the curve is on page four. I can put it here. And so there is our graph. And now we can digitize that curve for displaying over with the rest of our stuff. I'm going to edit this graph, and I'm going to add a custom curve. And you would define this curve as a file so that you can recreate it or reuse it. So if you have a generator that you commonly use, you could save it uh, and create a little library of, of curve files if you wanted them. We're going to create a curve file. We're going to call it generator. Uh, and then we have a label for the uh, Curve file, this will be what is shown as the, uh, the default label um, on the, the curve, the, the, the graph that we create. I'll just call it generator for now. Click OK. The, then it's going to ask us to define the uh, axes for the curve. And so it wants to know our first, our current value in amps. So I'm going to specify the 100 uh, point on the axis. And it's asking now for this location. If I set my snap, uh, sometimes AutoCAD can snap two points on these uh, PDFs, and other times it can't. In this case, it can't. So we have to just manually eyeball it. So you might want to zoom in and make sure you get uh, the, the point as close as possible. So there's 100. And then we're going to do the 1,000 point. Uh, and then we need to know the points on the time axis. For the current, that varies depending on what kind of graph you have. So you need to specify the current and then the points. For the time, uh, generally speaking, you have 1 second and 10 seconds uh, defined somewhere. So we just ask for 1 and 10. So we specify where 1 is and then where 10 is. And now it wants me to define the curve. So I'm going to define uh, this purple one here. Going to start up here, and we just basically trace the curve. Uh, so we're we're choosing specific points, so it's it's not uh, 
you know, because we don't have the actual equation, so we're just digitizing some points and the software will kind of interpolate from there. So choose enough points that you feel comfortable with how it's going to look. When you're done, press enter. Uh, if you do a single line, you'll get just that line defined. If we did a second line, uh, it actually would do a, put the two lines next to each other and do a hatching between them. We're going to skip that and do just the single line. Uh, and so now it uh, has chosen that custom curve. It pulled in that default label I have, and it's using that curve file. I'll click OK to leave it, and then click OK, and it updates my uh, graph here to include that curve that we just defined. So if you have a curve that you need to include that the software doesn't otherwise have, uh, that's the way you can do it. And so that uh, curve file can then be used in other projects uh, if you have the, the same generator being used. So that's new. That is uh, actually not yet even released for the beta. We just finished that up this week. So that'll be uh, going out uh, next week uh, in the next version of the beta. Thank you for watching today's Design Mastery training. Contact us with questions or comments by calling 866-516-9497 or emailing support at designmaster.biz.